I sometimes wonder if the average person in revolutionary France, or in the early QSSR, or in the dying days of the Roman Empire, had any idea that they were living in such exciting times. Of course, every ideology in human history has had that moment when it falls apart, and every fall in human history has been marked by class conflict. But it seems almost taboo to talk about class nowadays, because we're not taught to think of ourselves as working class, as proletariat. Our enemies are not the bourgeoisie, not the owners of capital, but rather scoundrels or bigots. We fight endlessly over tax reform or mayoral elections and seemingly anything under the sun, and yet isn't there a noticeable absence? Capitalism supporters often take for granted the neoliberal position that capitalism is the end of human history. In this video we'll talk about the collapse that we see around us and give a final eulogy to capitalism, not the end of human history, but merely the dawn of a new era. Check out these videos for an introduction to capitalism, but the definition I'll be using in this video is current Western capitalism, with the means of production being in the hands of the bourgeoisie. I may also allude to free market economics and other attachments to, to capitalism when talking specifically about the problems these cause. I'll also be talking a little bit about liberalism, so it's important that you know that liberals are all of these people. For a better introduction to liberalism, you can watch this series here. Part 1. Why Capitalism Will Collapse As I alluded to earlier, one of the most pernicious aspects of capitalism is that the bourgeoisie control the means of educating and informing people. And of course, as anyone would do, this means they put out news and educate young people without any mention of capitalism's failures, or indeed of capitalism. Indeed, it's easy to see why, looking at a newspaper or a news broadcast, why so many people are still liberals. But not blaming capitalism for its own failures leads to a sinister disinformation, where so many people seem unwilling or unable to recognise the root cause of the problems we see today. So let's talk about growth. Capitalism, as practised today, follows a boom and bust cycle. The economy must continually expand, both to compete with other businesses that are growing, and to provide a constantly increasing profit for shareholders. Most major companies with shareholders have rules and laws requiring an increased profit, and that is success under capitalism, in theory, to the benefit of everyone. But of course it doesn't take an economic genius to realise this isn't sustainable. After all, there comes a point when you can't make any more money. See, capitalism is horrifically inefficient. It gives far, far too much to far, far too many, and deprives those who are unable to work, or unable to locate suitable paying work, from wages, which are at least a portion of their labour, if nothing else, and thus depriving them of the means to purchase consumer goods. Benefits, debt, payment plans, all have been used to try and curb this problem, but capitalists must keep wages as low as possible to increase the pool of workers from which they can recruit, and thus bring down working conditions and wages further, and also to continue making a profit, at least in the short term. Now inefficiency may not be a high crime, or might not have been, but unfortunately, the capitalist constant drive for profit has sucked the earth almost clean of resources, and without resources, or without the ability to exploit them, capitalism cannot continue. Without a constant stream of profit, the capitalist system falls into a recession, and taxes are used to prop up the private system. But we live in a finite universe, and capitalism cannot survive in a finite universe. The recessions will keep getting worse, and income inequality will continue to get worse, one of the only lifesavers for capitalism is war, simply because it boosts production and guarantees buyers for most capitalists. After all, if you run a factory producing expensive and useless consumer electronics, war is your mistress. The government will pay you a subsidy to keep running, you can profit, and for the sake of war, your employees' rights can be stripped away. Of course, the only problem with this solution is that you have to go to war, and that can't last forever. Capitalism, at some point, to throw Thatcher's words back in her fucking face, runs out of other people's money. Part 2. Capitalism, Feudalism, Monarchy It's really easy, and often encouraged by liberal media, to imagine capitalism has lasted forever. This is mostly based on the false idea that capitalism is just markets, but the idea of private property is just as ideological as the idea of monarchy. A good example, one that leftists do lean on a lot, is the French Revolution. Whenever a society's way of organising itself starts to fall in under the weight of its own contradictions, there are two major routes, revolution and reaction. 
you can burn the system to the ground and create a new order, or you can roll back reform and take solace in a mythical perfect history. But you can't reform away a monarchy in the same way you can't reform away capitalism. People like fairness and they want a say, they want inequality, they want to be able to have a good standard of living. And liberals will call for reform, or for that matter, argue against it, but it is inevitable. In the same way you can only patch a pair of trousers so much, you can only reform so far if the society in which you live tries to, to protect itself from upheaval, and most do. The bourgeoisie do not want an end to private property, they're not idiots. In fact, the rich are probably the most keenly aware of the way the poor can, if they realised and organised, overthrow the entire order. So reform is actually often argued by factory owners and capitalist politicians as a way to declaw workers' ability to organise. After all, if you apply a general minimum wage, it is no longer the workers organising collectively that bargain for a wage, but the government, whose own interest is in upholding the existing order and maintaining a growth in profits for as long as possible. Similar reforms were rampant around the time of the French Revolution, as well as the Russian Revolution for that matter. A quick look at the numerous parliaments, constitutions, organisational bodies prior to those revolutions is enough proof of that, and how quickly a reformer turns from a radical on the left to a, to a radical on the right once the workers take to power is also proof enough of one of the key facts of liberalism. It exists to defend capitalism and will take any necessary action ally with any necessary allies in order to do so. Part 3. The death of liberalism and a fond farewell. So capitalism is collapsing and it's not just me saying that. As I mentioned in the last part, liberalism doesn't have the solution nor the political will to overthrow capitalism, but instead tries to reform it, leading to a point at which revolution becomes inevitable or reaction takes hold. People know this, although most people can't tell you why liberalism is incompetent. The recent election results in the West and booming interest in both leftism and the far right show something underlying in capitalist society, that is, alienation and loss of identity. Liberalism's utter dependence on capitalism, and therefore the prize of ownership over the means of production, alienates the worker from themselves and from society, and in a time of bullshit jobs and automation, this has only gotten worse. When humans cannot express themselves except through a system that dehumanises them and strips them of what Marx called their species essence, they seek identity in other ways. Deprived of recognising in this identity to be working class, the capitalist media not too eager to encourage socialist thought, a great number of these workers find themselves at risk of being indoctrinated into fascism. It is only a matter of time until these expressions find their voice in more widespread violence and the final death of all that we know. Without this bulwark, capitalism in the West must decide its path. Socialism or barbarism. Look, I obviously don't like capitalism. I abhor its institutional inequality, I detest private ownership over the means of production, I despise its dehumanising nature, but capitalism, and liberalism for that matter, has been in the past a driving force for change. I did talk briefly about the French Revolution, and that revolution led to capitalism and imperialism, but it also led to universal suffrage, a widespread political understanding amongst the poor, and even the, the end of strict hierarchical society in France. Well, indeed, even Marx understood this. So as we witness the collapse all around us, comrades, it's important to remember what brought us here and what drives us forward. Farewell, capitalism, the long night from which we will soon emerge. Uh, rest in peace. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, my patrons here. This was a bit of a rant, wasn't very well scripted, so I'm sorry about that, but I want to get something out. Uh, my next couple of videos I have sort of briefly outlined and I'm going to be pushing forward with them, uh, probably no three minutes with for a short while, which is why I sort of had that extra long Castro episode. Uh, my next video specifically, I want to be talking about um, a little bit more about identity under capitalism and talk a little bit about uh, school shootings in America and things like that and, and, and where that comes from and, and uh, talk about the history behind that. All right. Thanks very much.